Tonight we're going to hear from someone who I respect and admire. He is a known scholar on campus and in the community. Dr. Bill Roten is a member of the Counseling, Psychology, and Social Work Department. Mm -hmm. And he is joined by Libby Ewing, who is a second grade teacher at the public schools. The title of this talk is The Future for American Education. Some see it, some don't. So if you'd please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. I wonder if uh, some of you folks, if you don't mind, come sit at the table because I'm going to do some engagement activities and you can help us, so whatever. If, if you can come to the table, that'd be great. <laughs> First of all, thank you. Don't be shy in this group. If you're going to do social psychology, there's no shyness. Yeah, right. Uh, thanks, uh, Sean, for inviting me. Um, I've come to a couple of these programs. They're great programs. It's, a great, it, it, it's just a wonderful opportunity for the community and the college and individuals to kind of get together in the same room and act civil. I, I think it's a great opportunity, really, in many, many respects. Um, I'm very comfortable with where I am. I'm very comfortable in the library. Uh, it's been remarkable to me. I'm doing a, a commercial now for the library. Uh, it's been remarkable to me how much this library has changed in a relatively short period of time. It's kind of gone from 1950 to the 21st century. Only well, it didn't take 60 years to do it. And so I'm catching up to learn all the deals, but it's just exciting for me. So that's great. And good to see some old friends. Mm -hmm. It's good to see some old friends. So I've got connections to the community. I'm comfortable in the space. And you know what more can a fellow ask for, really? I mean, that, that's just about it. Uh, so let me tell you my story. So uh, National Education Foundation gave me $5,000. It took a little chit-chat to get it. But anyway, they gave me five grand to buy some equipment, uh, video and audio equipment that we placed remotely in classrooms, several classrooms. And there are four or five teachers that are kind of in the process. Most recently, Mrs. York. And so I sit on one side of the street, and I'm capturing what's happening in the classroom. And I'm watching Mrs. Ewing go through her paces, and the kids doing their things, and everybody's kind of doing their stuff. And it's dawning on me that, in fact, we're looking at different classrooms. I'm looking at one way that reflects my experience and perspective. Uh, Mrs. Ewing is... You know, she, she's the operations intelligence of the operation. You know, I can, I can talk in generalities, and I can visit with these guys, and kind of act like I know what I'm talking about, but it's very abstract compared to the details and so forth. So, really tonight's discussion is about American schools, but it's not the typical discussion where we get together and we complain about what schools do and what they don't do and how we can improve them and yet or yet or yet. Where I'm starting is kind of where I think most of us are uh, in our culture. And that is we're dependent upon some mandated standardized tests to measure achievement. And in many cases, we use those results in the United States also to judge uh, the quality of the teacher, whether or not they're effective. And that's kind of where we are. So what I want to do, in effect, is I'm going to start with that model and then we're going to see what different perspectives we can have on that model and what difference that might make. So, I went first of all to the Sean Hartman Props Department. But she didn't know she had one of those. <laughs> yeah, but it did. Uh, and so, uh, my friends here will, will help me out, I guess. And here we got something, anyway. There's one side and then there's the other side. Now, this is a very old lesson in metaphysics, but it's one that, that, that's really potent that you can follow along, partner. What do you see? A uh, person. Okay. With, uh, his hat on. Mm -hmm. He has a beard, beard, mustache. Yeah. There's like an army behind him. Mm -hmm. Some jewelry. Some jewelry. Yeah. What, what's his skin color? Brownish. Okay, olive perhaps. Okay, good. Now the way we play this game is you'll only believe what you see. Why don't we go over here? 
Okay, run me through the drill again. What do you see, my friend? Okay. And it has a woman on the back. Hold it. Is there a woman on that picture? No, there is not. Oh, interesting. Keep going. Um, she has some jewelry. She, um, I don't know what area she's from, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, probably Ottoman Empire, maybe. Um, okay. Uh, there's, uh, looks like a fort in the back with a church. Hmm. To be honest with you, I just don't see that. <laughs> I really don't see that. Now you might say, that's a really crazy way to run a railroad. But you have to remember in the world, between 1920 and about 1960, that was science. In other words, science was, if I see it, I'll believe it, that's science. If I don't see it, I don't believe it, that's not science. And that was called positivism. Okay, now the hard science has stayed with that a really long time. Okay, but then eventually they discovered, you know, maybe there's more to what I can see than what I see. Okay, so a lot of what we're talking about tonight is observation and perspective. So let me see how well you folks can observe. Look it up. So if everything works, if the glass is on, we'll see what can happen. This is a test of selective attention. Count. Don't worry. How many times the players wearing white pass the basketball? Start again. This is a test of selective attention. Count how many times the players wearing white pass the basketball. How many passes did you count? Okay. What do you think? Okay. <coughs> no. Well, see, I had a problem right away because uh, wearing white, I saw two people with white shoes on. No. Oh. Okay, so when I saw the white shoes on, that gave me problems, and so I didn't count at all. Oh. Uh, I was like, oh, wait a minute here. I need to have more specific information before I'm going to play this game. Okay, let's get going. Fifteen. She said fifteen right here. Fifteen. Anybody see that? Right. That's, uh, That's pretty good. Well, let's keep going. The correct answer is fifteen answers. <laughs> but did you see the gorilla? Yeah. Yeah. This video is from Search by Daniel Simons and Christopher Shabri okay. and is copyrighted. It is available for use in oh, talks, God. training, and teaching on DVDs from Discog Productions. Okay. All right. So that's observation. About half, about fifty percent of the people will see the gorilla. About fifty percent of the people will not see the gorilla. But once you're saying there's a gorilla, you'll see it. 
Most people do. Anyway. Okay. So that's kind of observation. Let's go back to the school problem. And the school problem is we have this standardized score, we have this teacher, and we want to we want to blame the teacher or make the teacher responsible for whether or not their scores are high or low. Okay. But let's play the perspective game again. And the way we're going to do this is I'm going to be the student. Now, in this case, normally we talk about classes, schools, districts, states, and international tests, and we talk about countries. Okay, I'm going to bring it down to the most meaningful level in education, a person. That's me. Okay, you can talk about classes and all that, or read my law, but it's me. Okay, I represent that person. Okay, so I'm Bill. I'll be the Bill in, the, in these stories. So what I've done is I've created scripts from different perspectives. Okay, and from the different perspectives. So let's, and Bill is a person that's in the ninth grade. He's taken, taking science. He took the state test and did poorly. Okay, that's, that's what we know about Bill at this point. So what we're going to do is we're going to take different perspectives. So here's Bill's science teacher. And just to keep things jazzed up, our science teacher is not male, it's female. So if you read that script. You want me to read it right now? Yep. Okay. Students like being in my classes. They tell me that they find science exciting and understandable. I am particularly pleased that many of my students are now considering science as a profession. I am not an easy teacher. In fact, I expect a lot from my students. Students are welcome to join my class, but I expect them to work and to learn. However, I firmly believe that all students can learn, including Bill. Bill's situation can change. His low performance is not a permanent problem. In every class, I intend to have all students, even Bill, fully engaged, active, excited, and enthusiastic about science. Unfortunately, Bill has not demonstrated much enthusiasm for science. On the other hand, I am more than a teacher who knows something about science. I want also to be able to create a learning culture in my classroom, which is psych psych psychologically safe. I want my students to feel that they can make mistakes and learn from them. Good science is all about exploration exploration and curiosity. Okay, good. So I build in, in the science teacher's perspective, there's a lot known about effective <coughs> teaching and ineffective teaching. I build in there some characteristics of effective teaching. High expectations and so forth and so on. A safe environment. But we've got to hear from some other people. We've got to hear about the <coughs> curriculum. In this case, we're going to hear from a spokesman in the State Department of Education. Talk about the curriculum in that science class. Okay, from the State Department of Education on the science curriculum. The middle school science curricula are both a mile wide and state specified topics, a mile deep. Bill receives a survey on key topics in science so that he can relate <coughs> intellectual, excuse me, intelligently to fundamental concepts of sciences, so essential to our culture in the 21st century. Bill must also acquire a more detailed facility with topics targeted for ninth grade science, like the value of clean water, biodiversity, and air pollution. Bill will not only learn key concepts about hydrology, but he will also participate in field projects to evaluate water purity in local lakes and to measure the costs involved in the maintenance of clean and safe water. The best science teaching is uh, particip <laughs> participatory. Participatory. That is, Bill could be actively could be actively engaged in what he learns, and therefore will mentally construct the concepts of science to make them meaningful to him. Modern educators call this constructionism. Okay. So there we have a statement about curriculum and what a good curriculum operates at, and our science teachers doing pretty well at that. But don't forget about Bill. He didn't do very well on the science. Okay. So on it goes. Now we have the district superintendent will tell us about the value of, well, let's listen and see what the superintendent says. <coughs> Bill Sands' teacher plans her lessons carefully. Planning, including assessment, is essential and characterizes America's most effective teachers. Her science classes are challenging, and students like Bill must follow class events carefully if they wish to succeed. Much of this science class is hands-on learning. Students do instructional activities to learn. Bill's teacher 
provides multiple opportunities to practice skills in the laboratory. Our middle school science teacher is professionally active in her own professional development. She wants to improve her teaching. She believes that professional growth should never stop. Okay. So far, I think uh, science teacher got pretty good going up. Okay. Let's complicate the little picture because life for Bill is more than life in the classrooms. So let's hear it from Bill's mother. Bill will never be a great student. In fact, no one in his family went very far in school. When he turned 16, I want him out of school and beating the pavement for a job. Bill's dad lost his job when his shop laid off the newer workers. Recession for us means food stamps. I never, I have never asked for help before. Bill should contribute a few dollars each week and help the family crawl out of this pathetic life. I really know very little about happen, what happens in Bill's school. I care, but I really do not have time or the energy. I work 12 hours a day and 6 days a week at a local retail store. For me, life's a struggle, to, a battle to pay bills every month, and a struggle to pull my weary body out of bed each morning and to report to a dead-end job. I really have time or energy to talk to Bill. I love Bill, and I hope that he makes it big. I want Bill to have a better life than I had, but I don't know what to do. Obviously, we can't afford to send Bill to college. Okay, so that's, that's mom. Okay, same kid, same situation, <coughs> same level of performance. Okay, the building principle, well, let's see what the building principle knows. Again, another perspective. All, most of these are school perspectives, but nonetheless, tell us about the building principle. I maintain a school with a safe and caring environment. We are here to help, and we have many teachers and counselors more than willing to listen and help. I'm not sure whether Bill has util utilized any of our services. My assistant principal told me that Bill was sent to detention yesterday. He fell asleep in science class. He was probably up all night playing video games. This was his first detention. Okay. Now you're going to hear from me. I'm Bill. Science is boring. In science class, my attention in class grips. I think about a lot of stuff. If I stay quiet and think to myself, I am not sent to detention or to the school council. I do not expect to be a scientist. In fact, I know no scientist, and no one in my family is particularly interested in what I'm learning in ninth grade science. However, I really am excited about computers and how computers can predict the future. Heck, we have a few computers in the classroom, but we have very little opportunity to spend much time with these computers in class. In fact, how do computers, how do they predict the future? That, to me, is a really exciting question. Let's be truthful. I don't care much about the fact that species are going extinct or about pollution. However, I've seen some really cool stuff about pollution on the internet. I wish that someone would help me understand more about what I am seeing. So for most of the time in the class, I sit quietly, watch the clock, and think about stuff like computers. Computers are cool. I do not see myself going to college. I will join the army like my uncle and go shoot someone in Iraq. One of my teachers once told me that I was an average student and that I would not go very far in education. She was probably right. Mrs. Ewing? Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> hmm. I guess my first question would be, why didn't someone know this kid before now? And my question would be, um, how large is the school system, and were there things that could have been done to prevent? He's pretty much lost in the system, system, isn't he? He's absolutely lost in the yeah, system. Yeah, because but mother says they don't have time, but I've worked with a lot of parents, Hispanic parents, in, in Scott's Bluff, and I find that they're afraid of the school. They don't know right. what to do when they go to school. That's absolutely, and, and I would be willing to bet that this just didn't happen over a nine month period in ninth grade. Mm -mm. That this was being lost in the system in seventh grade, in fourth grade, in second grade. He was more than likely slapped with a label when um, he first came into school and slapped himself with a label. Um, the mom has already said, you know, nobody in this family really goes far. We don't expect much. He's grown up with that perspective his entire life. 
with the exception of seeing the uncle in the army, and that perspective is even skewed mm -hmm. as to what possibilities right. are there. And because so he could go to the army and he could get a tremendous amount of computer skills and, and branch out to those sorts of areas that he enjoys. But again, the perspective of, of himself is just so fragmented. It's almost as if they're, it's almost as if he's transparent. Oh, absolutely. And he's got these coping skills to stay transparent. So mm -hmm. I stay quiet, so I stay to myself. Unfortunately, he fell asleep once. But other than that, he's pretty quiet. He's under the radar. He's not out, you know, burning bridges. So, you know, he's probably, people aren't going to know him. Oh, yeah. As we saw here, because I built, if you could carefully go back and look the way I wrote it, no one seems to really know him. The no. building principal yeah. doesn't know him. You know, and we don't have an advocate we don't know who his advocate is, except himself. Right. And, and, and most of the time you look to the parents to be the advocate. And as a parent yourself, you want to be the advocate for your child. But even in that, that's gotten lost in a cycle that um, the parents aren't maybe aware of the fact that they can be advocates and, and what possibilities there are for them. Mm -hmm. It's just sadness. Is this, is this so bizarre that it never happens? No. Or? It's sad. But I see it in second grade. I, I don't see this with a ninth grade student. I see this with second grade kids feeling like they have no worth. Hmm. At the age of eight, these things have been set. They have slipped under. They have gone past. They have known the ways to get around. Letting anybody into their sense of who they are. And it's very sad for me, but I... It's it's disturbing at the ninth grade level, but I see it younger and younger. Mm -hmm. I see kids learning coping skills so much earlier. If you don't mind, let's go back to the original question. Is we got this low standardized score, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so, okay, I'm, I'm out here, so I'm going to say, well, obviously the science teacher is lousy. Oh yeah. So help me understand why in your mind. How do you process? Um, Why is that score low? We really don't know. So we're right, just... right. Um, you know, I definitely look at the at the type of kids just from what we've gotten to know about who Bill is. Um, maybe he's had some learning disabilities along the way. Maybe maybe that's something that has not been caught. Maybe standardized tests really aren't his thing, but a, but a hands-on sort of thing um, is his thing with the computer piece, you know. Hmm. Not everybody is necessarily cut out of the same mold. His reading scores or his language art scores could be phenomenal and hmm. science is something that's bringing him down. Hmm. There's so, so much to look at with who But imagine, makes up just story. listen not just to the content what Mr. Joey is sharing, and, and I appreciate it, there's a really hard question that's reason. Whoa, what's <laughs> going on here? Um, but the fact the, the message I'm getting from that, you know, someone's got to stop and care for Bill mm -hmm. long enough to at least consult the data, the files, what the school already has. Oh, yeah. And better than that, you know, someone's going to have to reach out and say, how are things going, Bill? Mm -hmm. And mean it. I don't mean as kind of, you know, as, I don't know, whatever. Yeah, you know, how Oh, good, good, good. Right. Oh, you're talking. Oh, sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Let me get my letter. Yeah, yeah you, you got that routine that. now. Um, <laughs> now, you know, school, if that's, the, if that's the culture of school, and I'm not saying it is everywhere. Obviously, it's not. But you got to imagine that between 5 years old and 18 or 17, the kids spend 12,000 hours in school. 12,000 hours in school. So obviously, it's going, whatever happens, we're a product of our experience, it's going to leave an imprint. Oh, yeah. On the other hand, you've got to remember, during those years, they're spending more than $100,000 at home. So whatever is proportional to the amount of experience, so one begins to wonder, you know, like, what's happening at home? Well, we have a little insight here. And people have done surveys on that. For example, they've asked, they said, okay, how, how many, how long does a parent have on average with a kid per day in meaningful conversation? Now, by meaningful conversation, I'm not saying, you know, pick up your room and, you know, and so on and so on and whatever, or do your homework. I'm talking about meaningful conversation. 
like how are things going? Do you like do you, do you like science at all? What are you really interested in? You know, those are the kinds of questions that become the meat and potatoes. Okay, so they've done this survey. The answer to that, on average, to, with a parent, a child spends somewhere between two and five minutes per day. That's not long. Okay. So what I'm saying is those scores, perhaps you'll agree, Mrs. Young, those scores reflect a lot of things. Oh, absolutely. Much of which you can't control. I mean, you can't go back and re-engineer the genetics. You can't go back and pick out different parents. You know, and then you got yourself as well. I mean, you know, all these things, and some of which we can control, and some of which we cannot. And and as a teacher, in, in the system that we have, you only get them for nine months. Mm -hmm. Our society is not that which you get them for over a period of years to where I can get this built up. You know, here they come to you in August, and they're this shell of a person, and if someone has already learned these coping skills of not letting anyone in, then probably about December they're maybe letting you in. And then they know that May is right around the corner. Mm. So you really only have a fine window of grabbing and holding and, and nurturing that piece for a kid like this because guess what? I'm crawling back in because you're leaving me too. Mm -hmm. You know, here comes April, here comes May. And I got to get ready for, for what else is to come. And summer's coming, and you're not going to be around next year, so back I go. And I mean, I've seen kids like this. I've seen that where you just think, oh my gosh, the first day of school, this is going to be it, and you're going to just love me, and I'm going to nurture you, and yay, life is well, this is how school goes. And it's not like that. You don't, I mean, a kid like this isn't going to. Sure. I've just got to comment on that, Libby, and you have such a great point. When our son was a first grader, I'll never forget the last day of school. He got in the car, and I thought he'd be jumping up before he started crying. He said, Mom, am I ever going to see Mrs. Sam again? Mm -hmm. He was touched by her. I said, I bet you can go back in and give her a hug. You know, yeah, yeah. And she reassured him that, you know, we yeah. see. Yeah. But, you know, I think they do, and, uh, you know, Fortunately, he comes from some other functional family. We're not all that dysfunctional. But um, I think they do feel a loss uh, that you're leaving him. Okay. And so yeah. when he said that, I thought, wow, that is so. You know, those little people yeah. grow up to be da da. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we, we kind of bring that baggage with us. <coughs> so if you think second graders are tough to get through, Go teach college students. <laughs> these, these guys are real cool. But you know, the thing of it is, is that it's a choice to be in college. It's yeah. not in second grade. Mm. It's a mandatory sort of thing. You know, I mean, you're forced to be there whether you like it or not. College is somewhat of an optional piece. And so right. the kids that you do get, at least in college, maybe it's the, the making of the parents, so to say. But I mean, I would hope that those of you particularly in educational psychology are, you know, out of a desire to, to you know, be interested in that field, or at least explore it to some extent. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had several college classes that I did not do well in just because they were really fun classes. In fact, I had more than maybe one semester of those really fun times in college. Right. But I just think, you know, yeah, they don't, they don't get to pick who their parents are. They don't get to, and if you don't share anything outside of their four walls, that's what they live, and that's what they cycle and come back and repeat. So I'm wondering if uh, we, 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 we look at their, use different perspectives, mm -hmm. whether we just come to a different feeling about what we're looking at. And it's kind of amazing that even changing a word, just a word or two, can make you look at things quite differently. Let me share a one of these if it works for me. Okay. Maybe a commercial first. I'm sorry, we live in America. <laughs> but maybe not. <laughs>
it says their perspective of the world. <laughs> perspective before I became a mom and that's really changed and I'm not encouraging those of you that are in college to go out and have babies right now before you go, uh, <laughs> go out and be teachers go ahead and get that education first um, but I I definitely took a more um, a much more family approach to my teaching than I did before and part of it was probably just the first few years of teaching and surviving and figuring out wh what the lesson plans looked like and what classroom management looked like and, and how things kind of went together and what I was expected to do and what the kids were expected to do and, and all of that. I completely understand why in the first five years we lose a lot of really great people because it's an overwhelming business. It is overwhelming to think of the time that is spent and it's overwhelming to not just what you're giving to kids, but your influx of knowledge that happens within that time is just phenomenal. But I really started to take more of a family approach in teaching because I thought, these are somebody's kids. Mm -hmm. And when I thought about the time that I spend with them and what I thought about what was going on with my classroom management and how I was setting rules, and I would have the kids help me with the rules because I learned that in my classes and I knew what I was supposed to do and that you know, if they help to make the rules, they'll really be a part of it. And and so I thought, oh, well, I can do that, and we'll kind of manipulate. So when they say, oh, you shouldn't trip someone, yes, great, let's have our rule, be safe. Be safe is excellent. Well, they hadn't said be safe. And so in an essence, I was creating these rules for the kids. You know, be safe, be respectful, and be responsible, boys and girls. These are the three things we need to have. But I could see in their faces that that's not necessarily what I was talking about, teacher. And you didn't really give me a chance to have my voice be heard. And so it was again kind of like, okay, and now you're in my bubble and you're in my world, so this is how it's going to go. And when I started to kind of open up and really listen to the kids more and really listen and have them truly feel like they were a part of the family, and I really made it be a family approach, and I was very honest with them, it really started to change the way I feel like my classroom went. And I'm not a perfect teacher by any means, and on any given day you can see me lose it on my kids, and on any given day they go home saying, she's horrible, and on any given day they say, she was the greatest teacher ever. A lot depends on the snacks, if you have them, or treats if you've got a special day, or you do an art project, or the greatest thing ever. If you have a test, you're not so great, but I really do think that the family approach to 
letting parents know that we're all in this together and it's going to take all of us. And the kids having the sense that I'm a part of something that's bigger and, and just being honest with them and saying, you know, we're all in this together. There are going to be times when we like each other and there's times that we're not going to like each other. There, you know, but this is a part of the bigger society and you're going to have to know this rule from now until forever. They really responded to that well. Very much so. One of the things Mrs. Ewing is doing is, is very typical of, of effective teachers is she's very mindful. She's reflecting, thinking about what she's doing, having the effect, and so forth. And uh, that's a pretty key step, I mean, for anybody doing anything, I suspect. Yeah, but some have difficulty doing that. And I think the truth should be said of evaluations. I, um, my husband and I, my husband is a high school English teacher, and so we joke about um, the fact that I have them young, and I know that the kids come to see me for Halloween to get treats, and then our house gets egged, and I know it's his high school English kid saying that they didn't really care for his, <laughs> his tactics in school, but we joke about the fact that we'll see them all the way through, and so um, just it's interesting the different perspective that comes with that, too, and in seeing the kids in high school and what kinds of things are put on um, you know, the different levels of teachers and standardized tests and, and whether or not that kid got noticed throughout the system, mm -hmm. I think makes a huge difference. It's amazing. But the family piece at home, too, I mean, there are some things you'll never get to come back, but as a teacher, you get to have a part in the way you make them feel, and you get to have a part in the way you react to things. I had a kiddo... Um, last year who came from a very abusive, and I shared this story with Dr. Roten, he was from a very abusive um, home life and made numerous calls and, and did all that I thought I could, but he was a kiddo that needed the security of a blanket, and at times I would be teaching a math lesson and he would be under his desk or in a little hideout that we had made back behind in the table. And so he would be at the back of the room and, and he would just kind of go back there and I could just tell if he was having an off day and he'd be all over the floor, and then I'd have an O&P student in there, and they would kind of look at me like, do you know there's a kid that's under the desk back there, and he's not, not, he's not even watching, and he's not even... But I could have asked him at any given moment, and he knew exactly what was going on. But the, the poor little guy had not necessarily had that in, in schools that he had been in or places that he had been. And he, you know, he was told that you sit in a seat. When you are in school, you sit in a seat. When you are in my class, you participate. Mm -hmm. When you are here, you do this. This is what's respectful. You look at me, you look at the board, you answer questions, you do these things. And, and I thought, whoa, that's not how he functions at all. Now, was he learning? I certainly hope so. His test scores might not have reflected as much growth as I would have liked to see, but you know, after you get to know him, you know what, <coughs> you know what works. And, that's your job. You do everything that you can. So Mrs. Ewing and I were looking at the same classroom, but we were looking at very different classrooms. I mean, she saw individuals, she saw children, she knew histories, so forth, she knew names. You know, she had relationships that I did. I was sitting across the street acting like an educational psychologist or whatever, and I saw variables. Okay? I saw studies. I remember studies. Okay. It's not to say one necessarily is invalid and the other one is, is valid, but I think it, you have to say, in fact, they're different. And, but together, and plus other perspectives that we could add together, would give a more comprehensive picture. And so when people rely so much <coughs> that politicians of whatever type and don't make a difference, the party or, or whatever, but <coughs> when you rely so much on a few scores, and their analysis goes no further than is an effective versus an ineffective teacher, you've got to say to yourself, wow, there's really more to that story than that, mm -hmm. and what's involved. You know, this thing with this testing is, is very interesting, and it has another layer that really doesn't have much to do with Bill, so let me share that layer, and uh, we'll see what this looks like. Commercial. 
Predicting the future is hard. We got a commercial. But I have this new smartphone, and now I can see everything more clearly. I can organize the analysis, sort through all the data, maybe even rattle some cages. I predict that I'm going to like the future, because the future's where I'll be serving up humble pie, a la mode. AT&T introduces the Samsung Galaxy Note, phone, tablet, both. We're back now with an alarming report on our school <coughs> the possibility of widespread cheating on achievement tests that are used to measure how well our kids are learning and overall success rates in school districts across the country. The report out tonight by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution builds on the paper's earlier investigation that schools, uh, that city schools. Our story tonight from NBC's chief education correspondent, Rahima Ellis. Until last year, Atlanta's once struggling school system seemed to be making the grade. But an investigation by the Atlanta Journal-Constitution found the numbers didn't add up. It published a series of reports, including claims the strides were too good to be true and as extraordinary as a snowstorm in July. A statewide investigation by Georgia's governor discovered systemic cheating. 178 teachers and principals from <coughs> dozens of schools were implicated. Education officials resigned. The Atlanta scandal prompted the newspaper to look further. Analyzing more than one and a half million standardized tests from 69,000 schools nationwide, the AJC found nearly 200 districts had suspicious scores that resembled those that entangled Atlanta. In some cities, the scores change so much that there's virtually no chance of it happening, according to our experts. You'd have a better chance of winning the lottery. In its report out today, the paper says nine districts show inconsistencies so extreme, the odds that they occurred without an intervention are more than one in a billion. According to the report at Patrick Lewis Downtown Academy in St. Louis, 42% of fourth graders passed the state math test in 2010, just before state investigators began looking into possible cheating. The following year, only 4% of fifth graders passed. In a statement to the AJC, district officials acknowledged the strangeness of score changes, but disagreed that cheating was to blame. At Fort Worthington Elementary in Baltimore, the paper also found as many as 20 mistakes were corrected on some exams, often in a lighter shade of pencil. The district issued a statement saying, it has been zealous in our attack on cheating and places external independent monitors in every school during state testing. Reaction from other school districts vary, but includes charges the AJC's report had errors in methodology and that test gains were due to increased reading and mathematics instructional time. When asked about the report, Secretary of Education Arne Duncan said, the findings are concerning. It's unclear what's behind the inconsistencies cited by the AJC. This encourages further exploration of these unusual patterns, but it doesn't necessarily mean that there's widespread cheating. The Atlanta Journal-Constitution points out, and we should too, that most educators don't cheat. And there is value in testing data that can help teachers determine if students have basic skills. Still, some experts charge that high-stakes testing that links funding and jobs to student performance can lead to abuse. Lester? Hey, I was with us here in New York tonight. Thanks. That's another dimension, <laughs> isn't it? All of a sudden, now we got, we got a moral dilemma. And it's not Bill's problem. Another problem. This is quite a quagmire that we work ourselves into. Milton. Well, I have so many things to say that I did. Okay. it would take a, a long time to get through a lot of them. However, people are making a living. And when people start making a living, they end up having mortgages, children they want to put through school, car payments whatever. Um, there's a, a lot to push people into making sure that they have employment. 
Um, and when I look at the levels that most teachers live on, um, to me it's real close to uh, nothing. Mm -hmm. uh, in other words, your subsistence living. Uh, I, I don't really think of a lot of teachers that I know um, who are well off. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I, I can see pressures that, that would come to, come to bear. And then some of these statements to me are kind of cliché. Um, of course they're going to have to try to measure something. And once you try to measure something, then you're also going to put some weight behind what that measurement is. OK, so um, who, who's going to do the Who's going to do the measuring? I mean, you know, who's the watcher of the watchers kind of thing? Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, all I'm saying is that I look at this and there comes, I teach, okay, I love <coughs> teaching, but there are problems with the system in which we teach, and I don't care what level it is, there are problems, and you've touched upon some of these problems that make it very difficult to teach and to learn. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have any big answers to give to you. I can only see a lot of heartbreak at college level when I teach most of the time. I see people being brought into college, Penn State, they went down and picked them up in buses in the ghettos and drove them up for the summer and gave them free room and board and lodging because it would give them grant money from the federal government. Yeah. And then left them on the street at the end of the summer. They hadn't learned much. They didn't have the, they had no methodology or, or anything about it. But they went along the streets with a bullhorn. Would you like to go to college? Well, yeah. Most people would like to better their lives, make themselves something more than they are. The horror, the horror, the horror, you know. The, <laughs> I've seen this. I've seen the dorms uh, totally destroyed by this group of people who had no idea how to live in a place that you would take care of things, turn the water off, not break the window, not pull down the blinds, mm -hmm. uh, not spit in the corner. Uh, I'm not trying to find fault here. I'm trying to say this is who they were. And they were, and they in the end knew that they weren't really being given a fair deal anyhow. Mm -hmm. But I would see some of the disasters of those people going back into a life of servitude. Mm -hmm. who really had a desire to learn. Mm -hmm. <coughs> so, so the conversation then needs to be far greater than test scores and bad teacher. Yeah, yeah. I mean, these are just some of the, these are some of the parameters, but... You know, we've got ourselves into an interesting situation, which you, you think of the tweets and all this kind of stuff, where the emphasis is on quick, short communication. You know, there's some questions in life that really do take long answers. And this is the kind of conversation about schools, incidentally, that's been going on in America more than a century. Now, with every decade or every few years, you know, the way it's shaped, formed, and delivered is different. And now it's being delivered in terms of standardized tests and so forth and so on. So there, there is a shift and change in the process. But I think it's a, a, a remarkably important thing because it tells you so much about the culture, because it tells you about the relationship you have with children or students, and even something about how you, your culture deals with the cultivation of talent and creativity. I mean, it's a lot of big issues in culture. Now, let me throw at least one more claim sure. <laughs> into this whole thing. At Penn State, I taught, um, I was a graduate assistant, and I was given 40 students, basically, freshmen. Um, and you went over <coughs> some freshman literature. Um, so that you might have some idea of American literature and so forth. I decided, uh, there were generally about 40 some students in the class. I decided on the first day to give everyone A's. Mm -hmm. I told them, 
you all have A's, you don't have to come back. Hmm. Well, some of them came back for about a week. Mm -hmm. And I'd say the same thing every day. You don't have to come back. You already have an A. Mm -hmm. You've got an A. Is there anything here you really want to do? Is there anything that we've got in the synopsis of what we're trying to do that interests you? It got down to about 8 to 12 people out of the 42 in that class. One of the most amazing classes I've ever had. I don't know whether I taught it or I learned. Mm -hmm. uh, we went over all of the information and a lot more that, that mm -hmm. was in the syllabus. And I found it to be a, a tremendous learning experience. Mm -hmm. Now, you, now, my dean called me in at the end of that time, and the steeple were up his hands and said, Mr. Wolf, uh, I see that you've got 42 A's here. Yeah. I said, yes, sir. Yeah. And then I explained to him this uh, method that I had come up with. And he was amused, um, but he said to me, um, do you like receiving a... a, a teacher's assistantship, Mr. Wolf? I said, yes, sir, I do. He said, you know what a bell curve is? I said, yes, sir, I do. Mm -hmm. He said, if you want to continue to have these assistantships, I will see a bell curve from now on. Won't I, Mr. Wolf? Mm -hmm. I said, yes, sir. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, there's rules for the road. Uh, the rules, the the road. But the rules of the road are what we were, I thought were, in many ways, are some of the things that keep us right. from teaching and learning. There's a fascinating book years ago by Eric Frome called Sane Man and Insane Society, yeah. which picks up exactly that thing. Otherwise, we'd be okay. But sometimes things get out of whack. And that's important. We haven't heard from so many of you. Maybe they've gone to sleep, Sean. I don't know. I have a question for you. So what is your solution to Bill, who does not do well in science? Uh, well, the, I have the solution of, uh, well, you'd have to ask the detail person. I don't operate there. I don't have that solution. Uh, the solution I have to what we're talking about is obviously that conversation needs to be expanded, so forth and so on, but that doesn't necessarily help Bill. But picking up, learning, and I've learned a lot from Mrs. Ewing, picking up from what she said, I would say clearly in that we're, we're going to have to find some way to affirm people. We're going to have to find some way that somebody knows Bill's name and something non-trivial about Bill and show some real interest. And, it, and it's just remarkable, if you do that, how, how individuals can respond. Now, how that practically plays out, Sean, uh, because we have Milton's problem, which is these are the rules of the road, okay? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, it's I not think, a real practical. I think you're right, and I think uh, Mrs. Ewing hit it right on the nose, too. A lot of times, uh, beginning at younger years, children are labeled, and they have this, I can't, I can't, I can't, and in high school, it's just not... Mm -hmm. It's not an option to go to college. You're going to get out. You're going to go to McDonald's and work. Now, that right. was, it wasn't an option with our kids. You go to college, or mm -hmm. it, you, you know, you're on your own. Mm -hmm. You know what's yeah. interesting, Sean, as you say that at the beginning of the school year, when we're building what we call our social contract, we don't have. I mean, we have procedures in our room, but we have more of a social contract, and those are the governing sets of rules. And the kids have all decided on those. It has to be voted on 100% in our classroom. And I was telling Dr. Roden, we've had some things on our social contract that were um, as, as direct as, we don't want you to tell the same joke twice. So they really did not want me to tell the same. If I had told one joke, I should not tell it again. That was something. <laughs> and the whole class voted 100%. So there went up on our social contract. And it wasn't labeled under be respectful. It was, please don't tell jokes more than once. And I said, well, I'm okay if you tell a joke more than once. I maybe haven't heard it. But we also have a funeral um, at the beginning of our school year for I can't. And so every child in the classroom writes, I can't, and we put it on the board. And I said, from now on, this is a bad word. And you've already said there are no bad words allowed in our room. And so we take it, and the kids are just like, I mean, first of all, they just know that I'm dead <coughs> from day one. But they bring their little slips of paper, and we all stand around the garbage can. 
and then I give kind of the eulogy of I can't and how you've been a part of our lives for so long and it will be so hard to live without you, but we just have to release you. We have to let you go. You need to go to a better place and we're moving forward and we we can't have you dragging us down anymore and then we all rip up our I can'ts mm -hmm. and if you want to say a special something about I can't and then we put it in the garbage and we, we say our goodbyes and you can use the phrase, I'm not able to yet. I'm not able to write without my training notes yet. I'm not able to find my pencil, but you cannot say it in a matter of frustration. I can't get this math problem. I can't spell this word. That's not allowed. And so then they really check each other, you know. Oh, I just can't. <gasps> the whole class just shudders. Oh, my gosh. Yes, you can. Don't say that. Remember, we had the funeral. You can't. Oh, my gosh. You know, it's like all of a sudden it's become this kind of a fun joke, but it's um, mm -hmm. very much that feeling, and this weekend I went to a birthday party. My youngest daughter turned three, and my grandmother earlier in the month turned 87, and we had all ages of celebrating March birthdays in my family, and, and my grandmother got this plaque that says, your story is waiting to be told. Mm -hmm. And I thought, shouldn't that be the label on every single one of us as human beings? Mm -hmm. My story is waiting to be told. Because the first thing I want to share with my teacher on a Monday morning is that I got first place at the wrestling tournament. Mrs. Ewing, did I tell you that I lost my tooth? Mrs. Ewing, did I tell you this? Or Mrs. Ewing, I can't wait to tell you. Oh, Mrs. Ewing, I learned how to. Mrs. Ewing, I... And sometimes your mornings get overwhelmed with those sorts of things, but mm -hmm. recognizing that we are each that. And as a teacher, I want my story to be told too. I mean, I'm very open with my kids about things that are going on in my lives, um, you know, in my life and in the lives of my kids and the lives of my husband. And, and they're excited and they feel a greater part of that, that we really are a family. I have cried in front of my school children. We have laughed until we have tears in our eyes. We have, we have gone through the gamuts of every part of life, and I will continue to do that because... Aren't we all just waiting for our stories to be told, really, in the essence of going around this crazy earth? And, and our time is really limited. I mean, we don't know. We don't know that you sitting next to us aren't going to be here tomorrow or that, you know, it's you're not going to make it past first grade, as sorrowful as that it is. It actually is past my bedtime, so I'm going to get out of this room. <laughs> may not make it out of here. Christine? Um, I just had a question about the test score cheating. I think we all kind of know that self-perception can factor into capabilities. So has anybody looked at, I, I assume, I know like when I was standardized tested as a kid, we got our results back. So the kids that were corrected, did they get their results back? And did they have, you know, oh, I am better at math. Do you know if there's been any research that? I don't know. Okay. There's a lot of work on self-fulfilling prophecy type of stuff, the information of this. I think it would be interesting to know if any of those students did start to have better results and then to see what happened when some of these cheating That's scandals came out. That's an interesting question, though. Mrs. Ewing's comment about everybody has a story. I'm kind of reminded from a quote from uh, Robert Coles, who's a child psychiatrist for years and years, and now he's since retired. But remember, he's a psychiatrist, he's a clinician. And he was talking about patients, and he said, every patient has a story. It's my job to understand that story. And I think, going back to Sean's question, Bill has a story. It's my job, if I'm an adult in contact with Bill, that I make an effort to understand his story. Easy to say, difficult to do. That's interesting. And uh, working in the library, and Christine could probably attest to this too, we uh, employ student assistants sometimes up to 20. And often we'll have them four years beginning from the freshman to the senior year. And it is just such um, a good feeling to see the way they grow mm -hmm. inside and out, their confidence. Some of the kids are first generation or the ones that come and don't really feel that they can succeed. Mm -hmm. And uh, I've got to hand it to Christine. She's just probably one of the most, I don't know what she's got, but she can relate to the student assistants and they will talk to her and when you see them leave that last day it's such a good feeling knowing that Shadow State has turned out a good student. That, so in essence you know Mrs. Ewing is a second grade teacher, Dr. Roten is up into college, 
you never stop learning. But if someone would have just patted Bill on the shoulder and said, you know, what, what do you like? Mm -hmm. Teachers make so much difference, and mm -hmm. my hats are off to the mm -hmm. teachers. And also, I want all of you students that are here, it's so nice to have you. I'd like to invite you back. And also know that we at the library care. We're not scary. Yeah, Christina, Christina is a favorite, but often I'm out there. Uh, it, I'm kind of getting off, and I know everyone wants to go. But we're in the midst of renovations in the library, big time renovations. We're going to have a coffee shop. We're going to have happy learning. It's going to be information commons. Yeah, da 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 da. So it's really exciting, and we welcome you to come in and uh, check out the changes. And if you have any suggestions, we are, you know, more than happy to listen to them. And I want to say and give credit to the person that is the spearhead behind that, along with the Grace Lecture Series. Uh, Melton Wolf has been here for seven years, and when Bill said earlier the changes that have taken place in this past seven years, it couldn't have happened without Milton. So. We're going to create an information comment here. We really do recognize that students don't come to the library for information. Okay. As, Coffee. Hey, the majority of faculty don't come here for information. It was definitely an exception. What they come here for is to socialize. And that is extremely important in their development, their educational development. And so we're going to try to create a place where you can get some good coffee, where you can get tea, where you can have some food, you know, an army travels on its stomach. Hmm. And by accident, you may just bump in to some information <laughs> that you've never seen before because we've got a slew of it here. But we know why you really come here. And hmm. we're not going to argue that that's not a good reason. You're going to be one of the most collaborative generations that have ever existed hmm. to our betterment. We need you to collaborate because we have problems that can't be solved otherwise. They're too big for one person. Well said. Anyway, thank you, Dr. Roten. This was great. I enjoyed it, and I hope all of you did well, too. Thank you for There's coffee and cookies. And especially Mrs. Ewing for being a good sport about yes, this. Yes, and Mrs. Ewing, <laughs> thank you too. Let's give them both up. Uh,